It's the evening rush hour on the M62 between Leeds and Bradford. But tonight, the problem is just off the motorway. Tango 80, we'll attend that one as well. In Birkenshaw, PCs Andy Bell and Wayne Baker are on their way to an accident involving a horse which has been hit by a car. One of the problems, obviously, with, a, with an animal and livestock is we haven't got the means of dealing with them and controlling with them a lot of the time at the scene, so it's, it's almost inevitable that we're going to need a vet or a, uh, some kind of assistance to either put the thing to sleep or to sedate it so we can uh, make sure that it's not going to cause any other problems for other road users. Normally, when we attend animal incidents, it's sheep, dogs, cats, much smaller animals, so this was quite out of the ordinary for us. Don't know about the lighting in the area. Obviously, if it's, uh, it, it's dark now, so if it is uh, in, a, in a dark area, the horse isn't going to be illuminated in any way. So it's, it's going to become more of a hazard if it is in the road. The accident is on an important link route between the nearby motorway and a major trunk road connecting Bradford and Wakefield. And as Andy and Wayne approach the scene, traffic is already at a standstill. We're here now, Coach. there's a Fiat Punto here with uh, quite substantial damage to the windscreen. Um, they've closed the road. I can see an officer in front of the other traffic car that uh, may be with the, maybe with the, like, the, the horse. But uh, we're going to go and obviously just uh, ascertain what's exactly taking place. to shut it around about the top and get him to go around or bring him past slowly. It's just what they're going to say. You haven't got any, like, No, we'll leave it like shut. That. I think leave it shut's the best thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I don't know the full ins and outs of how the accident's happened at the moment, but the Fiat Punto has obviously been in, has obviously been in collision with the horse. Um, at the moment, the horse is in quite a bad way. Um, it's got a broken leg that's just clear, that's been severed um, and the bone's showing there. There's quite a lot of blood around the horse, so the horse is in quite a distressed state at the moment. The owners of it are with it, and they're trying to calm it down and keep it calm while we get a vet here. Um, so the vet's on its way at the moment. How long they're going to be at the moment, we're just waiting to find out. So um, I'll go and try and find out what's happened um, in terms of the accident and how it's happened. Any type of loose livestock or wildlife can quite easily lead to a fatal collision or, f or fatalities, multiple. Hi there, you're right. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Are you a driver? I am, yes. Hiya. On that occasion, the driver of the vehicle was extremely lucky. On another day, we could be talking about something far, far more serious. Wayne must work out if the driver was at fault. What's happened then? Um, I, I was just coming up here. Yeah. Can you see that black van there? I can. Uh, about, well, uh, I've been told about four hours, four hour horses run out, and I just hit one of them. So, so they've run out from? From, from sorry, just there's that road there. Right. Like snick it thing, and they've just all run out. And you, right, and then, so it's run out in front of yeah, you. How fast it. were you going at the time then? Um, 35, maybe 40. Okay, then no problem. Just sit tight, I'll be back with yeah, you. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll in a be sec. Looking down there. Uh, the horse is in a bit of a bad way at the I've moment. So, leg. yeah, so the horse is in a bad way. There's quite a lot of blood. Um, whether the horse will make it or not, I don't know at the moment, but we'll just have to wait for the vet to get here and let them okay. have a look at it. A lorry driver is the main witness to the crash. Did you see the accident happen then? I'll give the details to you. Yeah. So, you were travelling, were you behind the punter? Oh, you're coming down I'm the other way? Down. I've just come down road here and I've seen this car swerve. Couldn't really see why it swerved with it being so dark and then noticed that there were five horses in the middle of the road and the cars hit one of them and the other four has just all run off down side of the road. So I've pulled over and managed to retrieve one of the horses and another gentleman got out here and managed to keep other three pinned into one side. The witnesses confirm the driver had a very lucky escape. He hasn't really seen this animal until it's been in the road in front of him. So his chances of um, reacting and avoiding it is, is nil. And the thing's just been on top of him straight away. So it's a fairly traumatic thing for the driver of the car. 
something of that size and weight coming towards the windscreen of your car, the natural thing you're going to do is kind of protect your face and probably let go of the steering wheel and let go of all control of the car. And in fairness, it's, uh, that could have swerved across in some oncoming cars and we could have had um, a serious head-on collision, but as it works out, the driver's done remarkably well. Now that he's worked out the sequence of events and cleared the driver of blame, Wayne examines the car to try to reconstruct exactly what happened when it hit the half-ton horse. If the bottom of the car here uh, has gone under its legs, the body of the horse would have been flung onto the windscreen and the roof itself, as you can see there. So it's probably taken um, a fair old impact as the car. Um, and that's obviously where the body of the horse has landed. So it's then come off the car. He's it's, it's probably gone over the top of the car, um, looking at it, and scraped off down this side. Um, the car's come through and has naturally come to a stop. So I'm quite happy with the speeds that he's given me, around 35 miles an hour. I won't, I won't disagree with that. I think that's, uh, that's fair in view of wet conditions. It's now been 20 minutes since the accident and the vet still hasn't arrived to deal with the distressed horse. Several workers from a nearby stables are holding the injured animal down, both to stop it hurting itself further or causing more chaos on the road. We quite keen to open the road but we can't distress the horse any further it's in quite a bad way and the main thing is we've got the welfare of the, the animal to consider as well as um, everybody else but we'll uh, we'll certainly get it open as soon as we can it's just a matter of waiting for the vet to get here to either put the horse to sleep or if we can look at getting the horse removed from the scene and out of the way if the vet's happy then we'll do that while they wait anxiously for the vet to arrive Fifteen miles away, just off the M62 in West Leeds, the cops are tracking a speeding car. As soon as I turned around and, and began to follow them, I could see that they were twice the speed limit, so straight away you, I tried, you're trying to get resources in place to put a stop to any potential pursuit. As more information comes in on the car, the cops have another reason why they want to stop the car and talk to the driver. Doesn't have any warning markers as such, but it's known for uh, burglary. Other police units, including PCs Rob Jones and Ben Waite, are making their way to help. There was every chance that it was the kind of car that would fail to stop for us if we asked it to. Given his manner of driving and how he's trying to push people out of the way, uh, Ben and I felt a need to get to Mick to help him with that just in case. As PC Mick Roth's onboard camera shows, at times the SEAT driver is pushing 90 miles an hour. And he's headed for the busy city centre. Our main um, focus there is to not get into a pursuit in a city area at that time of night with bad guys because it's all just going to end badly. We're coming to lot 58, boys, going across the bridge. Chapter. See you when you're we're just coming on to 58, mate. The cops need to take action now before the car leaves the relative safety of the ring road. I'm going to have to get on for a stop here because he's waiting for it. Are you anywhere near me? We are coming towards you. We're on 58. We're in the underpass. He's bought by traffic in a minute. Just get with me and we'll throw in fast. Yes, yes, mate. Mick's got behind it and it's, uh, it appears to be trying to get away from him. Uh, Mick, have you got your stop? Behind him now. Well, we're 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 now. Give it a reinforced stop to using it. As Rob and Ben catch up to Mick's unmarked car, he puts on his blues and prepares to stop the silver car which is just ahead of him. Come on, can light him up? Hey, up. See, oh, not going nowhere. Oi, oh, wind you your neck in. What's wrong with you? Hey, no. I thought you were following me. I'm driving like that, pal. We think it's nicked. Lads, we'll start off again in a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all right. I thought I didn't know the what. Just got to try and calm it down because it's going to get nowhere. It's only going to escalate. So you've just got to take a step back. Instead of shouting and bawling as well, you've got to come down and say, look, guys. It's only going to go one way. You're detained, you're cuffed, you are going to be searched, you are going to be dealt with. Just calm yourselves down. 
The cops want to know a bit more about who they're dealing with. So while Mick runs checks on them, Rob talks to the driver about why he was speeding at 90 miles an hour. I'm a wanted man, mate. I've got a few enemies. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I thought I might have been getting shot. Well, if you move and you can't get... Uh... What? As long as you keep moving, what's the problem? Yeah, you haven't got to drive faster, have you? No, you never... Like they shoot at... These shoot out of cars these days. I thought there were people after him and that he was going to be the victim of some kind of drive-by shooting, like we're in South Central Los Angeles and not Leeds. What have you got two phones for? Wife. <laughs> <laughs> now things have calmed down, the driver's claiming he's a reformed character. The joyriding days are behind me now. Oh, or the done got you. <laughs> Give over with yeah. you. But Mick's sure the men were trying to get away from him. I got in behind them um, and they absolutely nailed it. They were kind of twice speed limit and they were absolutely flying. Um, we get onto this underpass section, which is the inner ring road, and it's two lanes of traffic um, and you can't get anywhere else, but it was in and, out, in and out of lane one, lane two, lane one, lane two, trying to force his way through. So it had all the all max to me that he was going to fail to stop. I've been told in it yesterday and today. I mean, I get it is it must be where you drive. Oh. Information coming back from the police national database reveals both men are well known to the police. Having stopped and spoken to them and found out who they are, they're prolific two-in-one burglars. So their MO is to basically break into people's houses, uh, steal car keys and steal high-value vehicles. Jump out for us. The cops decide to take the men in for questioning, but before they do, Rob searches the driver. You know what you shouldn't have? Mm. No gear, no drugs, no guns, no... They're all in boot. <laughs> They're all in boot, are they? We were very, very confident. A lot of bravado, a lot of banter. Um, that can usually mean two things. It can usually mean, one, they're trying to throw us off the scent, or two, they ain't got anything. You got some cash in that pocket. How much cash you got on you? Not a lot. What do you call not a lot? Because that looked quite a lot to me. I oh, wear. Uh, pocket? Yeah. Pocket. Stay a pocket. About 300 quid, isn't it? Friday night. Is that good to be out? Stopping me from partying. The men and their car will be taken to Leeds Bridewell Police Station. Back in Birkenshaw, just off the M62, PCs Andy Bell and Wayne Baker are waiting for an emergency vet to arrive to treat a badly injured horse hit by a car. I do know a lot of people who have horses, and I know there's a lot of very upset young girls who were who were coming out of this lane to our to our left with the horses. We understand that the, the farm is where the horses are from up here and they use this field during the day. So the horses have come down the lane. I think they've been unsupervised and they've come into the road and that's when the collision's taken place. So but it's traumatic for everybody because there's, there's blood and the horse has suffered quite a nasty break to one of its legs. So it's not very nice. One of the main considerations I had when I was there was there was whilst we closed the road to traffic, we still had pedestrians coming by. Can you two be really big for me and just stay there? Can I just have a quick word with, is it Dad? Yes. Just, he's done nothing wrong, don't yeah, worry, I just okay. want to have a quick chat with Dad, but without you. Okay. There's a horse that's really badly injured and I don't want the children walking past it if it's going to distress them, that's all. So it's right. right to make you aware. It is laid in the road, there's a lot of blood. A lot of children go horse riding and that kind of thing, and, and just seeing that sight might live with them for a little while. So we want to get, we don't want the kids going nearby, but certainly people that are, are involved with the horse um, and the owners of it, they're obviously being upset. They've been, they're, they're crying, they're upset, they're hugging each other. So I think we know what's likely to happen when the vet gets here. I don't, I don't, I think they're going to put the horse to sleep to put it out of its any pain and suffering. So I think they're prepared, sort of preparing themselves for that now. With the vet struggling to get through the backed up traffic and the horse increasingly distressed, the motorway cops have arranged for firearms officers to attend. What are you looking to do? What's well, going to yeah, no we might have to try and dispatch it ourselves, but we're going to need a little traffic bit of, uh, a lot, well, a lot of space. Well, that's right, right mate. We as, as off police officers, but also as human beings, want to have the thing put out of its misery straight away. And the, the sooner that we can do that, the better. Our force supervision have dispatched the firearms cars with a view to, in effect, dispatching the horse on the scene here. At the moment, we need to look at um, getting the roads closed for quite some distance so they can work safely. 
it's important that we don't you know shock people upset people as a result of something we do but we've also got to balance that with the fact that the horse was unlikely to survive the road's been shut for half an hour and the traffic stretches back to the m62 three miles away fortunately the vet has finally made her way through the jam some of the logistics that we have in terms of whether firearms are used or not is the locality of where we are there's some houses here the type of weapon that they'd have to use and the ammunition that they'd have to use for that there's going to be some scattering behind it from from the ammunition so it's not ideal for us to use um, firearms really so the fact that the vets here now is superb because they can deal with it and, um, and we don't necessarily have to go down those lines anymore you know that as soon as the vet arrives a lethal injection would put the thing to sleep and that relieves a lot of tension and strain and emotion from the people who are involved. As upsetting as it is, I don't want to see any animals put down, I don't want to see any suffering to any of them, but we've still got to consider the travelling public, the fact that we've got the road closed, the fact that there may be other people around here that are a little bit traumatised and upset by what they've j witnessed or seen laid on there on the ground. So we've got this, we've got to consider uh, sort of the wider picture for the, for everybody else really and make sure that we're doing the best thing by the animal, best thing by the owners and everyone involved, but also we're dealing with it as expeditiously as we can so we cause as little disruption to the to everybody else. While the traffic and the cops wait for the vet to put the injured horse to sleep. 30 miles away near Wakefield, officers Mick McQuaid and Dale Anderson are just starting their night shift. We're straight out of the door. Uh, as soon as we've started, we've had a radio message of a, a serious collision. One that sounds pretty much as serious as they, they get on the motorway. Uh, cars apparently trapped underneath a heavy goods vehicle. The crash is on the M1 just five miles south of their Wakefield base. Immediate priorities are, uh, obviously, for the life and limb of the people in the car. If it has gone underneath a truck, the likelihood of it being very serious is, is very high and highly probable. 9 zero, we're 10 seconds away. Tonight, Dale is acting sergeant, so it's his responsibility to manage the investigation. An officer's already... Uh, I've already got the scene as such. What we're trying to do is get some cones out just to protect us. There's not really much point in us all being up there uh, when there's cars coming at 70, 80, 90 miles an hour behind us. His first job is to make the scene safe for him and other officers. He you help us get coned off? Only then can he concentrate on finding out what's happened. This is literally the walking into the unknown. Um, Looking at a car there, unless there's a third vehicle involved, it may not be as serious as first thought. But, in fact, there is another vehicle up ahead, which is certainly wedged into the underrun bars of the heavy goods vehicle. Uh, luckily, it's passenger side. Let's just hope we're only a driver in it. Uh, when you open that door, it's dark. You don't know what you're going to be greeted with. It could be great with an empty seat or, to the extreme, you could be de uh, dealing with a dead body in there. But no one's trapped inside the car, and amazingly, it appears there are no serious casualties. Is everybody out, Jack? Yeah. 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 When you open the door and you realise, even though injuries may be serious, they're not life-threatening, it, it changes the sort of approach entirely. Two cars and an HGV are involved. One car has got off lightly, but another has sustained major damage. Once I realised it was OK, the focus goes on to trying to highlight who was actually involved and who was driving, because there was clearly far too many people walking up and down that hard shoulder to have been involved uh, directly. Uh, people have clearly come afterwards somehow, and we, we need to make sure we're getting a true account early on. Were you involved in any of this? Have no, you come no, after us? Right, can I have... call all right. The men who are in the cars all appear to know each other, and to add to the confusion, another car full of their friends has stopped to get involved. Which one are you driver of? This one. I'm, this not driver. Yeah, I'm not driver. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Keep them here till we've got drivers. Keep them here till we've got drivers. 
It was quite a confusing scene because we were expecting to see one car and one truck involved in a collision and that's not what we're greeted with, although that's not very uncommon. We are also dealt the unusual scene of ten people stood on the hard shoulder. Who's got the key to this? I'll Just give me key a minute yeah. until we found out who drivers are. I don't want anybody to no, I'm the driver. The driver, driver of which, this? Yeah, this. Who's the driver of that? Of the vehicle, is yeah. there? What's his name? Uh, if he's wrong, you've got him, to have I, told you. I, no, what, what's his name? Not what you call Umo, him. Umo, Umo. Right, I've got keys to that until we get drivers. Who we wanting to find out who's to blame and who, who's the offenders. And um, we're wanting to make sure we get the right people. Um, because we don't always, funnily enough, get told the truth. Dale's priority is to identify the drivers of the two damaged cars. The black Astra that's crushed under the HGV and the blue Seat that's hit the crash barrier. Which car will you drive in? You will drive in that one? All right. Who will drive in Astra? He's in ambulance. Right. Jack, can you just keep hold of him for the time being? Having identified the driver of the blue Seat, Dale needs to verify who was driving the black Astra. Can I just confirm me what driver of the Astra and then I'll leave you a bit? I don't or? know. The one that I've been with that's collared down at the bottom was in the front passenger. Right. OK, so... Because everybody's pointing a finger at Astra drivers to this guy. Yeah, yeah. Is it your car, the Astra? Yeah. Right, you were driving it, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. A full statement will have to wait until the man's been seen at hospital but at least Dale has managed to sort out who the key players are. I've got everybody's details from the say out, we just need to concentrate on the... On I've the got driver now. details at uh, Astra, so... Astra? The Astra, which is under here. I thought it would be him. It's, an, it's a Mark IV Astra. All right. Right, so you've got all right. details out of Astra? I've got the drivers. All right. Well, right. I've got the out, so we'll just try tucking everybody else down now. Right. I'll get those. Now the cops know who's involved, they can move on to finding out who caused the accident. Well, many millions of journeys are made on a motorway, maybe daily, and not many end like that. So you've got to ask what, what's gone wrong in this, uh, in this circumstance to cause this. As the investigation continues... <laughs> 10 miles away in Leeds, PC Ben Waite is bringing in the two men who were stopped after hitting speeds of 90 miles an hour on the city's inner ring road. Got your ski jacket on, buddy. We're getting out in a second. While they're taken in for questioning, Ben and PC Mick Roth search the car for anything that might explain why they seemed so keen to avoid being stopped. Keep it on on these boys, though. Look at belts clipped underneath them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Clipped in underneath the seat so they can uh, get round, and then if you come round the back, you can see that they're clipped uh, around the back of the seats. There's no way they can be worn. Um, both of them are like that. It's usual MO. They clip them out of the way and they're out and running then. Happy under bonnet, mate. Unfortunately, there's been no items found or any items in relation to going equipped to steal or anything like that, so they're going to be released. But they commit an offence by not wearing a seatbelt, so um, we'll deal with them for that. We, we like to deal with anything positive as best we can, so they'll both be getting a seatbelt ticket. The men won't be prosecuted for speeding because Mick didn't have time to run an average speed check over a long enough stretch of road. These guys had only, had only followed for a short distance, and ultimately when we got into the underpass, they'd come down to speed limit level, purely because other cars had stopped them. Uh, going fast. In a ring roads and that kind of urban motorway, two lanes, very fast flowing traffic are very dangerous places. Had they continued to drive at that kind of speed, I would have dealt with them for speeding. You're lucky that you're only getting a seatbelt ticket. Do you want to watch videos and see how quick you were going? Yeah, exactly. You're lucky. At the end of the day, if that's all you can find on that particular occasion, then that's all you can deal with. Wearing your seatbelt is important. I still don't want them to go to a windscreen and end up um, killing or seriously injuring themselves, or anybody else for that matter. Hey, okay. See you later, fellas. Cheers, lads. Seven miles south of Bradford, the vet has put down the horse which was badly injured when a car hit it. The driver is still at the scene. It was an accident and 
We didn't stand a chance. It's a shock to the whole community. It's a tragic, tragic accident and, it, you know, you feel for everybody involved. It's just very, very distressing. But at the end of the day, no human life was lost, but the, the devastation that the death of the horse is going to cause the owner is, is beyond words. It's very distressing. Until now, the surviving horses have been corralled in the field. As they're led back to the stables, local farmers are helping to clear the blood and debris from the road. Meanwhile, the driver is still struggling to come to terms with the accident. It, it hasn't really sunk in yet. I think I'm still a bit in, in shock a bit. Um, but it, it's never nice, is it, when any animal or one person gets hurt? He probably had no idea what he'd hit and what was happening during that few seconds around the impact. And that thing's come through the windscreen. I don't know what he was going through at that moment in time, but it wouldn't have been a good place, and I certainly wouldn't want to go through it. With the road finally open, the three-mile backlog of traffic begins to clear. And as you can see, once we get our vehicle moved, the road's good, good to go, so we're, we're back up and running. Keeping the roads open is a priority, but that doesn't mean the cops aren't affected by the accident. And sometimes members of the public think, when we're at these kinds of incidents, they appeared the facade was that they're not caring and they're not, why are they not upset like we all are? And, and it is exactly that, it's a facade that we put on to prevent us from, so we're able to do our job and deal with what we've got. When we think about it afterwards, then that's when it becomes upsetting. On the M1, the crash investigation involving an HGV, a black Astra that ended up underneath it, and a blue Seat that struck the barrier is continuing. PCs Dale Anderson and Mick McQuaid are trying to piece together the events leading to the crash. They suspect one or both cars were out of control before they hit the HGV. At the moment, we're just trying to establish the position of each vehicle just prior to the collision, uh, and who's to blame, basically. They're speaking to everyone involved, but each has a different story to tell. With the Astra driver on his way to hospital, Dale focuses on the driver of the blue Seat. You just come and have a chat with me. Just tell me what's happened. We were driving. All right, bear in mind, motorway's not empty, Obviously. and other people have told us what's happened, oh, yeah. so please. I was driving about 75, 80 miles per hour. OK. I'm driving, I don't know where my mate is, because I've not seen his car. So basically what's happened, all of a sudden, something's hit me from the side. Dale seeks out the other witness, the HGV lorry driver, in the hope he may be able to shed more light on events. Hello, sir. Can you tell me anything what's happened other than the cars ended up inside of your truck? I, this almighty bump into the side of me, and then this car, this uh, Seat Leon, started turning about in front of me. I thought we were going to crash into it again. And then it just managed to move a little bit more and ended up halfway on the grass. So when I came to a halt here, this other car came from nowhere and crashed into side of the trailer. How the guy got out and walked away from that, I don't know. Don't know if all these guys are together or what. OK, thanks, sir. If the cars were switching lanes at speed, it could explain what caused the accident. Let's have a look down side of Sayat, then, if, see if we can find any damage, which will say which side it were on. Make. The cops believe the Astra driver may have been overtaking the Seat on the inside and hit it before spinning under the HGV. There's a lot of damage to the rear offside. I think that's where initial impact is between them. Between Astra and this, which would suggest Astra's in lane one. I think Astra's been in lane one myself. What we're doing is we're piecing together a big jigsaw. We've, we take into account what people say, we take into account what we see, uh, and we, we just try and put a picture together of what happened. The investigation will continue. But the evidence so far points to the Astra driver, whose car ended up under the lorry being at fault. The main thing is to prove, if there are any offences, we are keen to prove 
you know, who has committed the offences uh, and bring them to task, really, because these people do need uh, dealing with uh, quite thoroughly to, to prevent uh, road collisions and, and deaths on the road. Britain has just over 2,000 miles of motorways. They're among the safest roads in Europe, as long as you're in a vehicle. But for pedestrians, there's nowhere more dangerous. You drive along, your radio's on, you're comfortable, you're warm. You don't really take into account the kind of dangers of roads. If you stand at the side of a road like that and see the traffic going past, it's absolutely frightening. Not surprisingly, it's illegal for pedestrians or cyclists to use the motorway at any time. A lot of people have no problem at all just sort of walking in between two motorway junctions if it's just a short distance. They think they're quite safe on the hard shoulder, um, but they're not. And at night, when visibility is poor, the motorways are particularly dangerous. On the A1M near Pontefract, Phil Stonebanks and Dave Robson are on patrol. What the <laughs> right inside here. Phil Jesus. Tango 90. Tango 90. On the opposite carriage road, just seeing two young teenagers on pedal cycle cycling down A1. We're going to try around try and turn around to uh, catch him. We only looked about probably 12, 13 year old, but uh, just going to see if we can uh, head round and uh, intercept them and just find out who they are, where they're from and what they're doing on the motorway. Can you just confirm the pedal cyclists are travelling on the southbound carriageway? Yep, yeah, they're on the southbound carriageway travelling north. Our children. Thank you, thank you. Maybe they've uh, disappeared already. They should be somewhere around here. The cyclists may be locals taking a late night shortcut. This is where they were. I'm guessing they've uh, disappeared down the embankment onto the road down below, but certainly not around here. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to them. We had to go all the way up to the next junction, turn and come back. Um, by the time we'd done that, they'd disappeared off the network. They, you know, they might do it uh, on a regular basis, cycling up and down the motorway, so uh, eventually it's likely they'll, uh, that someone will hit them. We don't want that to happen, so it's, uh, it'd be nice to catch them and just take them home and suitably advise them in front of the parents, because I've no doubt the parents have no idea what they're doing. So it's, uh, it's an accident waiting to happen, something like that. If we had found them, then they would have had somewhat of a dressing down, to say the least, because they're just putting themselves and everyone else in so much danger and they just haven't got a clue. That's what they need at the end of the day. Maybe they don't get it at home, I don't know, but um, they've got to realise that uh, motorways are just not safe places to play. But taking shortcuts on the motorway is a huge problem for the cops, especially where the roads meet built-up areas. Maybe an opportunity presents itself to get home 10 minutes quicker, people take it, and it's just not worth it. Would you walk down a railway line? I dare say most people wouldn't, so what's the difference? The outcome will probably be the same if you're involved in something. It's 3am on the M621 near Leeds. The city and the roads leading into it are quiet but PCs Mick McQuaid and Dale Anderson still have work to do. We've just been dispatched to a call of a, a male on the motorway waving his arms around, possibly chasing another male on the carriageway. It's an urban motorway. Um, we do quite often get people coming from the estates onto the network for all kinds of reasons, uh, one of which possibly mental health issues. When we receive a call like that, it's, it's so far away from what your class as a normal act, someone running across a motorway or running up an hard shoulder. Coming to the area where he's been reported, uh, walking on the motorway, obviously Dale's slowing down now just in case he's in the middle of the, uh, the carriageway or there has been a collision. On average, 35 people are killed or seriously injured on the hard shoulder each year. Dale, there he is. He's running. 
My first thoughts are, what is he running from? I'm expecting him to say he's, he's running away from some, some disaster in his life. So the man's first question isn't quite what they're expecting. How do? How far can you go? How far can you go? I'm on rack. I go as far as I can. Where do you live? I'm in Leeds, but I'm walking as far as I can. Why are you walking as far as you can? It's part of the group. What group? The rag. What rag? Roll and Gripe. No, it's, it's so you've as far as I can. You've had a few beers tonight, haven't you? Huh? You've had a few beers tonight. Yeah, but as far as I can, like Calais and where I didn't go. I certainly never saw it coming. Uh, I never expected him saying he was trying to run to France. You're not going to get very far on motorway at this time of night. You're likely to get knocked over. What's your name? Cal. You'll just sit in our car, where's Cal? What is it, are you university mates or something, what you're yeah, out with? Yeah, rolling green pay, like, more as far as you can. It would appear that the Idiot of the Night Award goes to this chap. Uh, him and his university friends seem to have had a, uh, a few too many to drink and decided to see who can get furthest away. Uh, I think this guy was aiming to get to Calais, which is... Uh, it's only about a 260-mile drive and a 22-mile swim from where we are, so he, he maybe had a chance if, if we weren't so quick getting here, but uh, we'll see what, what he's going to say and that'll determine how we're going to deal with him, really. But one thing's for sure, he's not staying here. You, you, you are having a laugh, aren't you? No, honestly, I'm, I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've been serious, aren't you? No, it's the rolling group here, like, and as far as I can. There's people further down than me, so I'm... Right, how are you spelling Carl with a C or OK? Yeah, James Bailey, then. Hey? James Bailey. Every time we asked him his name, he gave a different name. Can we start again? What is your name? My name's James, like, Carl. Go James Bailey in Leeds. So at that point, you're thinking, is, is he just trying to avoid getting into trouble? Right, so you, your official name's Callum, but you're called... You use James, do you? No, call me Cal. All oh, right. Go, no, ja no go James. Like James Bailey. I'm not familiar with the student area of Leeds, and it, it transpires that's the name of an accommodation building. What year are you university in? First year. Is it fair to assume when you've not got however many pints of alcohol in your in your belly, you're a reasonably yeah, intelligent person? I go person. home with whatever you got. Sorry. I go home with because it's like meant to be the first year. OK, yeah, like, and I appreciate... So, I jinx at your university and such, and you're just wanting to have a good no, time. No, I have to get home now. Right, no, you, now you're going to listen yeah. for a minute, because you're running down a motorway, flagging your arms. Members at public, all right, uh, are ringing us because we're concerned about you for several reasons, all right? We don't know whether you're going to try and do something to yourself up here. We don't know if you're running away from something, because to me, it takes something pretty extreme to get me walking, jogging, running, anywhere near an hard shoulder when it's not related to my work. All yeah, right? Because one of them hits you at 50 mile an hour. <laughs> yeah, you're not waking up in the morning. Yeah. OK. His inhibitions were totally out of the window. He did not know the gravity of the situation he was facing. He, he had no idea of the possible consequence. It's not just the cops who are concerned about his welfare. Is that going to be one of your friends ringing because we're worried about you? No, she's gone um, kind of near Dover, so... She's near Dover? Yeah. How drunk are you? I'm not as bad as... Do you mind she... if I answer that? Yeah, yeah. Is that so... somebody else who's taking part in this game? Yeah. What's the name? <laughs> Hello? At the minute, your friend's sat in the back of a police car on the motorway on the M621. Yeah, that's, that's probably a good way to sum it up. Maybe uh, a clear mind at the other end of the phone. Maybe somebody who could fill in the gaps for us, tell us what's going on. Well, she can get any sense out of her? Yeah. All right. She says, there's no game taking place tonight. You've been in Leeds City Centre. Is that right? No, it's, just, it's a game, but... What have you been taking? It's just, like, vodka and coke. Coca-Cola? Like, no, no, no Coca-Cola, yeah. Looking, well, you're not your, anything else? looking at your eyes, mm. they are the most dilated I've ever seen. I've never took anything other than Coca-Cola. Okay. Could somebody put something in your drink? 
not from what I wear. You, like, you, I took the same amount as the girls took. Well, I beg to differ, because she sounds quite yeah. great and you're not. If Callum's drinks were spiked, then he may need urgent medical attention. It was just a moment when I said, maybe the penny dropped and this lad's not not the usual drunk and we maybe need to do that, uh, take that extra step uh, to make sure he's going to be OK at the end of the day. Callum. Yep. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you down to LGI. All right? Because yep. I think you should be getting checked out because of your level of intoxication. I'd like to think if it was a member of my family or, or my children and the police had, had dealt with them, that they did deal with them fairly. If that means forcing them to go to the hospital or even arresting them, I'd, I'd rather that than um, potentially have them injured or, or you know, come, come to some harm. Callum may have been saved from a nasty brush with the motorway traffic. But 25 miles away, there has been a serious accident. PCs Lindsay Pickles and Andy Barron have just received a call to assist with a crash on the A58. On their way to the scene, Lindsay's getting an update. 41, can you just repeat your last, please? I can confirm from the scene it is the third one. 120 received, uh, we are on route now. It's another accident involving cars and horses loose on the road. This time, it's cost a human life. Yeah, thank you, four, four, cheers. I'm just trying to confirm it. Is it a male that's deceased? I'm believing so. Um, I'll get back to you very shortly, but I'm believing so. No problem. It sounds like uh, there have been some horses in the carriageway. It's quite a major route with the Rochdale Road, isn't it, between... Uh, it's a fast road. Yeah. So if he's just been faced with the, the two horses in the road, um, likely it is he's had no, no way to avoid them. It's a fast road over the top, so it's unlit and it's a nat national speed limit, yeah. so it's quite likely that this, this car involved will have been travelling at speed. Mm. Yeah, clear left. How are we doing, ID? Why is Leslie? Found the wallet. Officers will soon be on their way to inform the deceased man's family. Lindsay also works as a family liaison officer, so understands what a tough call that can be. You've got to hope that you say the right things and you know what you've got to say, um, and it's the most tragic news that you're ever gonna you're ever gonna tell anybody. You can't imagine really uh, what what it's like for somebody to tell you that uh, that you've lost your uh, your son, your daughter. Um, you can never imagine it. Hopefully, we'll come back. To we knew how serious this incident was uh, whilst we were en route, um, but uh, the actual gravity of what we were met by um, is hard to uh, is hard to describe, to be honest. Literally, as we get to the scene, we're more or less upon the horses that that are in the road. It was um, it was horrific. Lindsay and Andy are briefed by the first officers who arrived on the scene. Three vehicles involved, which are still in situ. Very briefly spoke to the castle driver. He's been coming down from Littleborough this way. He's seen the horses just appear out of nowhere because it's black and it's dark. He slammed on. The side has been travelling up here. He's not seen them, just gone into both of them. Right. I think he's hit the first one. So is it the courser that he's clipped then, that post-collision with the horses? Or is horses. there another vehicle? No, horses and then the Corsa. And then there's another vehicle as well? Yes. Is that travelling behind the Corsa? I presume so. Right. It's imperative for us as investigators to, to find out exactly what happened so we can put something into place to prevent it happening again. So just waiting for collision investigation then in soccer? Yeah, and obviously getting and patrol officers will say about the uh, identity of the horses as well. Yeah. Before the investigation team arrive, the cops try to establish where the horses came from. I wonder if they are horses, because that looks like it's fenced in, doesn't it? Let's go have a look. 
Obviously the uh, investigation starts at the, at the collision scene and there's much information um, and evidence that we can get from that scene to build a picture as to what's gone on is, is absolutely crucial. Just looking to see if that's an entrance to that farm, but it's not. It was difficult to assess that scene because it was so very dark. There was no moon, uh, it was overcast, so there was no artificial light, there was no street lighting. You had to sort of have a look at where the horses were and then walk down the road and then see where the cars were. It hampered the investigation initially because you couldn't see everything all at the same time and it's, it's much, much easier if you can see the entire scene. Six people are killed on Britain's roads every day and in England and Wales, a coroner's inquest is always held after a fatal accident. Somebody's lost a life here, so we need to establish what's happened um, in yeah, as much detail as we can, um, more so for the family. Attending something like that where somebody's lost their life, uh, it, it, it is emotionally very, very draining. You start thinking about how you might feel if you'd lost a loved one. The specialist collision investigation team are on their way. Until they've examined the scene, the road will remain closed. Morning. Hi there. Hi, Lovey. You're going to have to turn round, I'm afraid. I take it you've come from one of the uh, houses up this road. Yeah, we shut it further yeah, down. Do. They have the ability to completely reconstruct that collision, um, uh, and they can quite often do it very, very accurately. Uh, and only when we do that can can we answer most of those questions for the for the families left behind. While Andy and Lindsay wait for the collision investigators to arrive. Over in Leeds General Infirmary, the student found running along the motorway by PCs Dale Anderson and Mick McQuaid is being checked by medical staff. Sorry about this, we wouldn't ordinarily brought him in, but one minute he's, he's talking something which is reasonably sensible, and the next second he's saying he's trying to swim to Calais. He's saying he's not sure if his drink's been spiked, so I thought we'd better, better get him checked over rather than dumping him at his digs like and, and leaving him be. I need to know if you have taken any drugs this evening. I've taken them from time. Okay. Apart from what? Like, I drank. Could your friends have given you anything you've not been aware of? Not enough. They could have had something accidentally. Somebody could have slipped something into their drink. It's quite easy just to slip an e tablet in or something else that dissolves, and there's no trace of it. And it, it you know, they don't taste it or they can't see it. They don't know it's there and they easily can drink it and it's gone. If something has been slipped into his drink, then recovering in A&E is his best option, as opposed to a day trip to Calais. It wasn't the best route to take because of what happened. But if, it, if what had happened hadn't happened, I could have got further. So it's just complete, pure luck what happened. We thought we'd, we'd got an understanding and, a, and an agreement and, and were intending to leave him at the hospital to be checked over. Unfortunately, he had other ideas. No, come here. I thought we had an agreement. You're not going home. No matter how hard we're trying, we cannot get this lad at this point in time to see what is obviously common sense. You can't make me go anywhere you want. I'm happy to go home you, now. You seem to be misunderstanding the situation, all right? We're not satisfied that you're of a sound mind to make these decisions. All right, because we're not going to run the risk of you walking to the next dual carriageway or motorway, all right, and doing exactly the same again and getting run over and killed. We'd already gone to the, to the extreme of getting him to the hospital just to let him walk away. How do we know we're not going to find him back on the motorway in 15 minutes' time? How do we know we're not going to find him underneath a bus in Leeds City Centre? Walk back in then, come on. free choice, that way. No, him can get look after yourself. Walk we, home we've got to make sure that you can. You're not fit to look after yourself. Right, go and sit yourself down. It's taken all of Dale's powers of persuasion to get him back inside. You get quite a lot of people wandering on the uh, on the network. It's usually from the uh, the neighbouring estates. Uh, people up at this time of day uh, wandering round. Um, <laughs> is he coming out again? <laughs> he's so determined that he's going to go home. He's, he's never even looked in our direction. He's just kept his focus directly in front of him. Uh, as, as if by doing that we're not going to see him and we're not, you know, we're not going to deal with him. Get back in. 
No, go on, I want you to spend an hour with these people. Let me assess you again in an hour. If they're happy to release you, they will tell you that you can go home. You are walking home in this state. So go back in, speak to the nurses, give them an hour. Come round, sober up. Speak to the nurse with me. Right, come on then, I'll take you in. Come on. I just want to go... No. Because if we let you go home and something happens to you, I've got to tell your parents why I let you go home on your own and come to harm. We've all been there. We've all been teenagers into us, 20s, uh, been given a bit of freedom uh, and got ourselves into a, a state. So I've got some sympathy with him. Um, he, he, was, he just had too much to drink. Eventually, the nurses agree that Callum is well enough to leave and Dale and Mick are driving him home to be certain he doesn't find himself back on the motorway. Yeah, I didn't meant to end like this. <laughs> no, you want to get to Dover. I've not come across a student who's tried to leg it to France before. Will I come across one again? Uh, hopefully not. All right, cheers. Thank you, mate. See you Thanks. later next time. Keep it a bit more realistic and maybe <laughs> aim for... To get, actually get home rather than another country. Okay. See you later. You have a monster of an hangover in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. And that's the future of our country. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully he'll have learnt from what's happened and if he never faces a situation like that again, well, surely it's an hour or two of our time what's been well spent. The impact of a horse on a vehicle, depending on where it where it actually hits, it is going to be massive. Right. What are the officers doing with them? Are they getting an know. account? So we could do with CIU at some point, um, with Soco, or with just Soco, going with the owners of the horse and photographing um, where they were tethered and where they think they've escaped from. Hello, mate. It's Andy Barron from Traffic Department. I understand you're with the owner of these two horses. Is that right? There is a possibility that the fencing had been tampered with uh, and we may have been looking at a criminal damage. Uh, there is a theory that the horses could have jumped the fence. Um, but unfortunately, we've got no witnesses or credible evidence at this time that will we'll say for certain which one of those theories it is. The collision investigation team have arrived and are beginning to inspect the scene. Actually, he's actually been pushed back at some point. They're trained to uh, basically reconstruct the, the collision as it's happened, or as they, from their calculations, uh, how they believe that collision's happened um, and, and why that person's died as a result of that collision. Look at that there. You've got blue, yeah, that's true. Right, you've a lot of damage around here, a lot of stuff's been taken out. The driver of the third car, a Fiesta, managed to avoid the other cars but struck the body of one of the horses. While the collision investigators examine the vehicles, Lindsay and Andy are at the hospital to get a statement from the injured driver of the Fiesta. Part of, part of the investigation, and, and more importantly our role, is to, to speak to people. Quite often they will forget things very, very quickly because it's been a traumatic experience for them uh, and they will push it out of the, out of the memory very quickly. He's injured but it could have been much worse. You've had a lucky escape by the sound of it, haven't you? Because if you'd have been a few seconds further forward, exactly. um, it could have been you well, hitting this horse, couldn't know, it? When I got into the car this morning for the first time ever, it didn't start, so I spent five minutes trying to get my car going. Um, otherwise, I would have been five minutes further up the road, and I could have easily been that car that had the fatality, and it, it was that close. I spotted two cars, obviously, together on the right-hand side of the carriageway and hazard lights on. So I thought there'd been an accident, so I slowed down and thought I'll go and see because I'm first aid trained. And I smashed into a dead horse on my side of the carriageway and went right over the top of that. Um, came down and my car veered over to the right and I managed to stop it. So I got out and there's another guy coming towards me and it was very apparent that the other guy in the car was dead. I managed to feel that there was no pulse, I managed to see that there was no breathing, but I couldn't get him to do any emergency resuscitation at all. Um, it was obvious that that was probably going to be a waste of time anyway. 
A lot of drivers will will panic and just freeze and sit in the car and wait for emergency service to arrive. But this particular person um, he had the sense he, he got out uh, and, and he, he, he tried to do everything he possibly could to, to make that situation better. Uh, and, and it was a very, very desperate situation. I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of why those horses uh, were in the middle of the road. There are many reasons why these animals might get onto the road, uh, and they quite often do. And quite often it's through no fault of the owners, and quite often it's through no fault of the drivers. It could be one of those few collisions where it's just an unfortunate accident, and it's happened uh, with no one entirely to blame. The coroner concluded the driver's death was accidental and highly probable someone tried to steal the horses before they ran away and collided with the motorist. The driver of the Black Astra that hit the side of an HGV pleaded guilty to driving without due care and attention. He was fined £110 and given nine penalty points. No further action was taken against any of the other drivers. And the student, who claimed his drinks were spiked after he was found walking along the hard shoulder by PCs Dale Anderson and Mick McQuaid, has made a full recovery.